All right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, before I really get into it, I just want to um, thank you guys that left a comment. That's fantastic. Um, I appreciate these very much. Um, hey, got one comment here in particular. The why is that so? LOL. If this wasn't so bad, it would be funny. The book of Revelation is signified. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. This means that all the imagery given is a is in physical signs and symbols that point to a spiritual reality. For example, the bottomless pit or the abyss is a Greek word that means no deep or profound knowledge of God. All right. So, what this fella here is saying is that I can't believe my Bible, right? So I can't trust my Bible. I got to apparent I got to depend on him cuz what he's implying is that my Bible is wrong and that he's right. There's no other way for me to view this. Anytime somebody points to the Greek, what they're saying is, you can't believe the Bible. Right? Because we're not speaking Greek. And the idea that I have to learn another language, I, I barely know English. Now I have to learn another language? I got no chance, man. I got no chance to learn the Greek. And that's very important because the Bible says many times man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, he says, uh, the, the, I'm not sure what he says, honestly. This means that all the imagery given is in physical signs. Okay. So the natural man receives not the things of the spirit. And this is an example of it, right? 1 Corinthians 2, 14. But the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, LOL. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, this is, an ex this is a great example of it, right? Um, because he's looking for natural things when in the book of Revelation, um, you know, wh whether it's the first chapter or the 20th chapter, we are giving a, um, visions by an angel in the spirit and, uh, it's, you know, I don't know what you even mean. It's, this is so vague. Physical signs. Well, when John sees these visions given by the angels, he's describing the things that he sees. Right? Now, the things that he sees are spiritual, not physical. Uh... In other words, all people, religious or otherwise, worship a false god. God is mind, thought, and consciousness, not some entity out there. Um, okay, then he goes into Joel and the locust. Alright, and there's a great rebuttal here by... Uh, Andrew Foster Chef, I appreciate that. Um, the only point I want to make is that uh, when you are not of the Spirit, you are the natural man. And you're not able to see the things of the Spirit. So therefore, it's very important that you be born of the Spirit of God, right? Once you are born of the Spirit of God, then the Spirit of God shows you the truth, right? Your eyes are open, right? Jesus is the Spirit of God. Jesus is the Spirit of truth. Jesus is the Holy Ghost. Jesus is God 
Almighty. He says, God is a spirit. John 4, verse 24, the word spirit in scripture is a metaphor for mind. See, this is looking at things from a natural man's point of view and not a spiritual point of view. Okay? And that's the way I'm interpreting his words. So you're, in a sense, saying that there is no spirit, but only the chemicals and the physical makeup that is in your brain. That's how I'm interpreting his word. Now, if I'm wrong, let me know. All right, enough of this. Enough of this, but I do appreciate that comment. Uh, it gives me and others and yourself something to think about. And appreciate that one right there without mixture. And of course, Roderick, always appreciate his comments. And all these comments I appreciate very much, but let's get into this. All right, so the second coming of Christ. It's a very important topic. And I want you to think about this. Is this a salvation issue? And, I, you know, I don't know how it's not a salvation issue. Because, what, what are you putting your hope into? Are you putting your hope into a thousand bonus years of having sex with unsaved people while you're still while you're in your glorified body is that what you're putting your hope into if that's the case I don't know that you're saved I, I don't know how you could be saved Seriously, if you're putting your hope into God coming back and then giving you your own planet full of virgins, I don't know how you could be saved. I mean, you might say all the right things. You might look good and decent and act good and decent, but are you, you're putting your hope into something that is it's not the same it's not the same at all so I'm putting my hope into God coming back and putting an end to all evil forever delivering me out of this wicked world into a world of everlasting life without any sin, any wickedness at all. <clears throat> right? That's what I'm putting my hope into. Not a thousand bonus years of, you know, whatever. Humpity dumpity, right? I don't care that... You know, I really. So I, I think I can't help but think that it is indeed a salvation issue. That's interesting. Okay, so let's get into uh, this gentleman right here, Jerry J. And uh, let's listen to what Jerry J has to say. I'm going to look at all of them and allow you to decide. But historically speaking, the earliest church fathers were all what we would call premillennialists, or more specifically, historical or classical premillennialists, because they believed in a literal thousand year reign of Christ after his second coming. And we see this in the writings of different church fathers, like uh, Papias, who, who said that the Apostle John promised a literal millennial kingdom. Okay, uh, a couple things here. One, <clears throat> um, instead of trusting the Bible, 
he's trusting what a man says and this is the issue people aren't trusting the Bible that they hold in their hands I showed you one comment here while well, the Greek shows this what well, okay so you can't trust the Bible and this guy says well the Papias he says this so you don't trust what the Bible says you're putting your trust in what man says oh what's the what's the verse that's in my head right now let me see if I can find something let me see if I can find something really quick here something about something in God have I put my trust I will not be afraid what man can do unto me I like that one it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man right that's interesting huh now I get it when the Bible says one thing and then a million people say another thing it's challenging what do you believe do you believe the Bible that goes against all these other people or do you join the crowd and go along with what they say because you're uncertain yourself so you're just gonna jump on the side of the majority and that's what a lot of people do and they join the majority they try to parrot what they say you know just like when you're in school you just parrot what the teacher says even though you don't understand it, as long as you can parrot it, you're going to get a good grade. Well, that's that's what's happening now, right? Romans 3, verse 4. God forbid, yeah. Let God be true. But every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So as for me, I'm gonna if I'm the only one, I don't care, I'm gonna believe what God says. And I'm going to count all those people as liars. Because what they're saying goes against the Word of God. All right. Uh, in the second century, in the early second century, Wait. which is the early one. Yeah. Now, hold on a second. I want you to pay attention to something that he said here. Literal thousand year reign of Christ after his second coming. And we see this in the writings of different church fathers, like uh, Papias. Like Papias. Now, who is Papias? He's putting the words of Papias above the Bible. All right. So I'm not going to play the whole video for you, but he talks about how it, the Bible is, uh, you know, um, he talks about, uh, um, you know, the different views on Revelation 20. Then he talks about how. Um, the word millennium is a Latin word meaning a thousand years well the, the word millennium is not in the Bible so why would you point to why would you even point to a foreign language to describe a word that's not even in the Bible <laughs> people are crazy they really are. Now, he mentions Papias. Well, Papias, who's Papias? 
Well, without getting too much into this, um, he's a buddy of somebody here. You notice the word here, Christian, oral tradition, Christian this, the, the canonical gospels. I mean, it sounds, the Bishop of Heropolis sounds very, very Christian was a hearer of John and a companion of Polycrap or Carp or whatever. Sounds very Christian. I mean, he looks Christian, right? We got the fish head. You notice down here, venerated in Roman Catholic Church. Do I need to say any more? So this guy is putting his trust and his hope and his faith in the Lord Pope and not in the Lord God Almighty. And that's what the whole world is doing. Now at the very beginning of this video, he starts to read Revelation 20, but he reads it in a modern way perversion in a modern version well, why is that a big deal all modern versions in the English language are somewhat based on uh, they're translated somewhat translated but based on Roman Catholic manuscripts the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus they are based on those manuscripts. Now, of course, they change it just enough so they can abide by copyright laws and sell their Bible version. I get that. But the basis for their foundation, or the basis for their uh, translation, is Roman Catholic manuscripts. <laughs> uh, I can't tell you how big of a problem that is. That day shall not come unless there come. I don't know the verse. What's the verse say? Something in the Bible says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. <laughs> is it not obvious that that day is here? What do you think? Jesus was going to come and then there was going to come a falling away? That's not what this is talking about at all. At the time that this was written, there's a warning for us that there's going to be a falling away. And if we piece that together with what we read in Matthew 24, for example, and accept God shorten those days there should no flesh be saved so we're um, progressing to a point to where there would be nobody on earth saved if God allowed things to play out but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened you think about in the days of Noah, there was only eight souls saved. In the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, there wasn't even ten righteous. And here in Luke 18, we got a great question being asked. God will, uh, shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear it along with, with them? I tell you that he will avenge the avenge them speedily nevertheless when the Son of Man cometh shall he find faith on the earth there's not going to be very many people saved right so of course there's a falling away where there are fewer and fewer people saved and more and more people deceived 
And this is consistent all throughout the Bible. Second Timothy 3 verse 13, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Things are progressively getting worse. I contend that we live in a world today where it takes a miracle for a young man or woman to be saved. It really does because not only are they um, enduring the challenges of growing up in a public school system that is completely anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-Jesus, but they're, then they're welcomed into a world where the TV, the movies, the newspapers, whatever, the internet are all against God, everything in life is against God and everything that we are being brainwashed with propaganda wise is this idea that politicians and the medical community and so on and so forth can save your life and they can't there's only one that can save your life and that's the Lord Jesus Christ and whether you accept it or not that is the way it's going to play out notice here in Matthew 24 you find this in Mark 13 and Luke 21 as well Jesus is asked what shall be the sign of thy coming of the end of the world see they wanted to know about the end of the world back then too I think everybody in a sense well at least everybody ought to be curious about the end of the world and they were certainly and so they asked and that's a great question to ask the Lord Jesus Christ what shall be the sign of thy coming of the end of the world and the very first thing he says is take heed that no man deceive you now catch this for many shall come in my name saying I Jesus am Christ and shall deceive many you know what that means right that means many people who claim to be Christian who say Jesus is the Christ he's the Lord he's the Savior he's done it all for us he's God Almighty they're gonna say all that and they're gonna deceive many people the warning is not about you know what uh, Charles Darwin or, or any of his cahoots, you know, any of his, uh, you know, uh, his people, right? It's, it, you know, the atheist and the, the Neil Tyson, whatever that guy's name is, the scientist, you know, it, those guys. The, it, Jesus is not warning us of those guys that flat out deny the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is warning us of those people that claim to be Christian right you see it now because there are Christians people who call themselves Christians who are deceiving people and being deceived there is this falling away and because people that claim to be Christian aren't recognizing the fact that the Pope is the Antichrist the Antichrist or the Pope is gaining more power and influence all around the world more so today than ever now the younger people this might be nearly impossible to understand but the older people I would think would have a at least some sort of understanding that for example 
when I was a kid, Catholicism was completely different than Christianity. Everybody knew it. I was I didn't grow up in the church. I grew up in a bar, but everybody knew it and understood it. There's a big difference between Catholicism and Christianity. Today, nobody knows the difference. It's um it's incredible. It's more incredible in my opinion than going from a phone on the wall to a phone in your pocket. That's a little change. The phone on the wall to the phone in your pocket, that's a small change from 50 years ago. The, what a great change this world has, has um, faced in the last 50 years is the power and influence of the Roman Catholic Church. And I don't think hardly anybody, it seems to me, recognize it. I don't know, maybe people are just afraid of the Roman Catholic Church. But when I see people quoting modern versions I'm certain that this fella has no idea that the Bible version he's quoting from is based on a Roman Catholic manuscript or manuscripts. The Vaticanus, the Sinaiticus, the West Cotton Hort, Roman Catholics. Now, if you, if you understood the Bible and you understood Daniel, how he talks about four beasts until the end of the world and then the end of the world comes and a fifth kingdom is set up so the beast represents kingdoms there are four kingdoms four kingdoms until the end of the world and then of course the fifth kingdom is the everlasting kingdom right and Daniel names the first three kingdoms the Babylonian Empire the Medes and Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, never mentions the fourth kingdom because it hadn't come into play yet. But we can figure out who that fourth kingdom is by reading the New Testament. And that fourth kingdom is clear. It's the Roman Empire. Now, unless... You want to say that we're in the fifth kingdom, the kingdom of eternal life? Then you have to admit that we're still in the fourth kingdom. Now, the fourth kingdom or the fourth beast is the beast of Revelation. And you read in Revelation 17 the beast that was talking about the Roman Empire. The beast that was and is not and yet is. Well, how is that? Well, it's pretty simple. It's pretty simple to see once your eyes are opened. The beast that was is the Roman Empire, the physical empire that ruled the whole world. that transformed or transitioned into a spiritual empire. And this is why it, it's called the Great Whore. Because she is not the bride. The bride is the true church of God. The Great Hooker or whore, whatever you want to call it. It's a fake bride or fake wife. It's not the real wife. It's not the real bride. It's a false bride pretending to be the bride, performing the duties as though she were the bride and she's not. Now, once your eyes are opened, this becomes very 
very clear. All right, and then of course it takes uh, some understanding also to realize that hey, you know, I don't know what Bible version he. I don't even care. It doesn't matter. I know it's. Uh, I know if you go to Revelation 20 and somebody says uh, uh, having the key of the abyss, <laughs> I know right away that they're quoting from a modern perversion, modern version, right? And of course, just in case, just in case you're still listening and you're new to what I preach here this is very important to understand man because I'm telling you the Word of God the Bible the King James Bible is the pure Word of God it is directly from God it is not from man and it is not a translation of another language but a translation of from heaven to earth in the English language. Now in second, oh, where am I at here? Yeah, second uh, Corinthians chapter two, verse 17, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. All right, so let's, oh, let me show you something real quickly. I'll try to make this super quick here. If we look at, there's about 50 so different translations here. All right, and you'll notice here that all your favorite modern perversions change the word corrupt to peddle, to sell their Bible version. For we are not as many which peddle the word of God. We, we're not as many that sell Bible versions or whatever, however you want to equate it. That's exactly what they do. They've taken away the fact that many people are corrupting the Word of God, and they changed it to peddling, which is exactly what they do. Do they out? They corrupt it, and they peddle their Bible version. They change it just enough so that they abide by copyright laws and make a lot of money. And they're... It's a win-win for these guys, right? Win-win for these guys. And <laughs> doesn't it make sense that these guys would be doing it like this? Exactly like this? And because they're able to do things exactly like this, it's as if this is what was meant to happen. And this is why God told us all these things. And now we're seeing it play out exactly like this okay in other words uh, what is this uh, verse that I'm looking for here I might not be able to find it real quickly here behold I have told you before see this is the way it's supposed to play out this is the way it's meant to play out Right, that God has given us the opportunity for everlasting life, given us the opportunity to be born of the Spirit of God and to never die. And he's going to come back because this world is in severe decline. And we're heading to a point to where there would be nobody on earth saved. And that makes me wonder right now, You'd like to think, oh, this, this person's saved, that person's saved. We got a bunch of saved people over here, a bunch of saved people over there. What if that's not so? What if there are only a handful of people on earth today that are saved? Yeah, there's no way for us to know who's saved and who's not saved. Now, you ought to be able to know if you're saved. That should be obvious when you're born of the Spirit of God there it should be crystal clear now let me so let me finish up on that uh, I don't think there's anything more I wanted to add but let's just give him a couple more words here who who said that the Apostle John 
promised a literal millennial kingdom. Well, that's that's what Papias said. John never said that, right? And this is what I mean. People are putting their hope into a thousand bonus years of sexual immorality. So much so that they're putting their hope into a time period when they are in their glorified bodies and they're able to have sex with people who are not saved and who are not in their glorified bodies. And they're going to be able to command them, uh, be able to boss them around, what have you. That's what they're putting their hope into. Now, my, my question is, if those people that believe that, are they really saved? Because that then brings into question, is this a salvation issue? And I can't help but think it is. Because what are you putting your hope into? And I'll tell you right now, that thousand year dream that you have, it's never going to come true. It's never going to come true because when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, that's it. It's the end of this world. Everything is going to be done with. All evil is going to be done away with. There is no thousand years of, we're not putting our hope in a thousand years of peace. We're putting our hope into everlasting life. And so. Uh, in the second century, in the early second century, which is the early 100s, Justin Martyr talked about uh, a premillennial perspective that Jesus would return and then set up a thousand year reign. In the later 100s, which is the later second century, Irenaeus also said that he thought of it as a literal thousand year reign and he said that you should be careful not to allegorize the the passage all right so you're putting your trust in men from 900 to 1900 years ago that's great just anything and everything but what the Bible actually says it's incredible so I think I was gonna make a point earlier also that if you're reading from the modern perversions um, you can very clearly and very plainly see that these are corrupt and they are incomplete they are full of errors and contradiction now if you're a young Christian or a, a new Christian it takes time to collate the different Bible versions and to see that. I know that from experience, so I get that. But ultimately, if you're serious about learning the Word of God, you're going you're gonna to see it very clearly yourself. And, oh, no, wait a second, what am I doing here? I like to do the double capital for some reason. But you take... Uh, Matthew 18 verse 11 for example this for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost and then uh, you notice in your favorite Bible perversion that they remove that they remove that verse or at the very least they put a they put an asterisk or whatever put it in brackets and they say well it's, it's not there in some manuscripts or the latest and greatest or whatever the oldest manuscripts or whatever they say you notice it look at this this can't be the Word of God you can't a little child can look at this Bible perversion and count from seven eight nine ten and they know after ten comes eleven well if you have one of these perversions this goes from ten to twelve now you can't figure out if this is corrupt or not that's a problem man that's a big problem and therefore, you then have to say, well, this is not the perfect Word of God. The perfect Word of God is in the originals. And then you go to find the originals and you realize they're not, they're, they, they don't exist. There are no originals. And you look, go keep looking and you find out that, well, Moses smashed the originals. That's what he thought of the original. So the Word of God is not something stuck in old languages or on a table of stone. The Word of God is from heaven. And the Word of God transcends all languages 
for all time forever and ever so don't fret you God can speak English much better than you can all right and uh, much better than I can for sure and we don't need to learn five different languages to know what God says I'm having enough trouble learning one language I got no chance to learn another language and I know people come at me and say oh, well you gotta learn the Greek and then you gotta learn the Hebrew and then you gotta learn the Aramaic and you gotta learn the Latin and now I gotta learn the Ethiopian <laughs> that ain't happening Jack well, one I'm an old man and two I, I took I tried when I was a kid I, I couldn't do it I could not do it didn't have a chance okay so where was I going off on the, oh, okay, I got you. All right, so let's do it this way. Let's do it this way. Let's go to Matthew 18. And by the way, I'm not running on a script here. I'm just making everything up from the get-go. There was two things I wanted to talk about. All right, so let's go to Matthew 18. And I want you to show you something here. Let's add a parallel. What do we got here? NIV. Let's see if we can. 10, 11, 12. There's nothing. This is the perfect pure word of God? No. This is a fraud. But it's got that little A. Remember what we read in Genesis 3, verse 1? The serpent said to Eve, Yea, has God said? getting Eve to doubt the Word of God. It's the same thing happening right here in the NIV. Yeah? Has God said verse 11? Now, check this out. Where are we at? Some manuscripts include here the words of Luke 19 verse 10. All right. <laughs> the, the Greek word, yeah, has God said this? No, God said that. And so what I'm kind of looking for here. Oh, okay. So this, all this is getting people to doubt the Word of God. All right, so, okay, what I was going to show here and this is not a good example <clears throat> all right so anyways the point that I wanted to make is um, you know they point to other manuscripts you know if you collate this long enough you'll see what I mean they they point to other manuscripts the oldest manuscripts say this right and they'll say some manuscripts say that okay but what they don't tell you, for example, is that these manuscripts that they're basing their version on, they don't have the book of Revelation at all. All right, and you, if you study this out, you'll see what I mean. They're lying to you, is what I'm saying. They're lying to you. They're getting you to doubt the Bible that you hold in your hands and if your Bible that you hold in your hands is the NIV you do good to doubt it because it is not the perfect pure Word of God the King James Bible is all right so let's go on to video number two I don't remember what this is about in less than five minutes we'll build the second coming framework necessary to understand end time prophecy and the crazy times we are living in. In Douglas Adams' 1979 sci-fi novel, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the supercomputer named Deep Thought reveals that the answer to the great question of life, the universe, and everything is 42. Yes, 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 yes. 42. However, this answer wasn't very helpful. Yeah, because that's not the answer. Jesus is the answer. So that's a great point, man. There's a movie from 70 years ago 
that claim the answer to life was 42 and that's wrong. That's a good job. Good job out of those guys. 42! So Deep Thought proposed that it build a new and better version of itself to figure out the right question to ask. Similarly, everyone wants to know the answer to the question, when is the second coming? If we could put this question into the supercomputer, the answer wouldn't be all that helpful unless we first got an answer to the question, what is the second coming? Yeah, okay, so it's interesting. Um, the question supposes that we need a supercomputer to tell us what God says. In other words, we can't just believe what the Word of God says. We gotta, we gotta go outside of the Bible to understand what God says. And so that's that's the world that we're in right now, right? So I'll say this again: that the key, the secret to understanding the Bible, the Word of God. The, the key, the secret, is faith. See, once you have faith, then your eyes are opened. So you, as a believer, can sit down next to an unbeliever, and you two can read the very same thing, but he's not going to have any understanding, and you are, because your eyes are opened. His eyes are closed. You have faith. He doesn't. And therefore, you can now begin to understand and to be able to see the things that you could not see before when you were like the fellow right next to you who is not saved, who is blind. I'll posit an answer to this question by using just three references. The first reference is from Joseph Smith Matthew, verse 26. The second reference is from the talk, Five Marks of Divinity of Jesus Christ. Then President of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, Ezra Taft Benson, gave this address at the University of Utah Special Events Center on there the 9th of December, 1979. The third reference is... ...I-78 of the Millennial Messiah by Bruce R. McConkie. In Joseph Smith Matthew, chapter 1, verse 26, we read... For as the light of the morning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, and covereth the whole earth, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Think about how the dawn breaks. It doesn't go from the dark of night to noonday instantly. Yeah. Think about this. As the light shineth... Okay, now I gotta, I gotta show you this verse here. Yeah, we got to look at this. Now, this guy is going to pull the serpent's trick. Well, where am I at? Uh, hold on. He might have tricked me already. Excuse me. Uh, this is really all new to me, too, so... In Joseph Smith Matthew chapter 1 verse 26 we read no verse 26 excuse me oops something wrong with my bible what am i missing here well all right. Am, am I in the wrong book? In Joseph Smith Matthew chapter 1 verse 26 we read, 
For as the light of the morning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, and covereth the whole earth, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man. Now that's from the Bible. Yeah, that's from the Bible. I'm looking for verse 26. Maybe he meant Mark. No, that's not it. Maybe he meant Luke. No, that's not it. All right, so I got to find a verse. Let's see, for as lightning come from the east and to the west, and so shall the coming of the... I can't quote it right. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, you see what's happening here? You see what's happening here. Light. Well, that's kind of like lightning. Of the morning. What well, the light of the morning is not the same as lightning. Well, it's, the words are real close, though, isn't it? Shineth even. For, that comes out of the east and shines even to the west. Right? And shineth even unto the west. You see what they did here? changed lightning to sunrise a slow gradual sunrise to whereas lightning is quick and powerful completely opposite of what's being taught here You know, I'm not too sure. You know, I've got a, my, my Bible right here. Yeah, I just want to make sure. All right, I just I'm looking through my Bible right here, and I'm gonna go to verse one. I turned the camera on, but I haven't puffed up my hair this morning, so now there's verse twenty-five, and oh, oh, yeah, yeah. There's no verse 26. There's no verse 26. So they've added a verse 26. And they've very cleverly changed the wording from lightning to light of the morning. And now they're going to build their whole doctrine on this manipulation and deception and just you know trickery and uh, they're gonna build their whole doctrine off of this BS watch think about how the dawn breaks it doesn't go from the dark of night to noonday instantly right there's a gradual increase in light starting on the eastern horizon yeah it gets brighter and brighter well you're right and the edge of the Sun peaks over the horizon yeah after that more and more of the Sun appears sure until the entire Sun is visible yeah it's a gradual process that uh -huh. takes place over just, several hours just like the end of the world President Benson lists three distinctly separate events what? quote president his Benson? first is that from a sitcom in the 80s Appearance will be to the righteous saints who have gathered to the new Jerusalem. In this place of refuge, they will be safe from the wrath of the Lord, which will be poured out without measure on all nations. 
The second appearance of the Lord will be to the Jews. The Savior, their Messiah, will appear and set his feet on the Mount of Olives, and it shall cleave oh, in twain, okay. and the earth shall tremble and reel to and fro. Oh. The third appearance of Christ will be to the rest of the world, and the Lord oh. shall be red in his apparel and his garments, like him that treadeth oh. in the white vat. Okay. End of quote. This appearance, also known as the Great and Dreadful Day, yeah. marks the final destruction prior to the dramatic changes of the earth right. that transform it into its millennial state. Yeah, and that's Elder when that's when you when you go out there and you get to have sex with all the unsaved people. Yeah, that's great. All right, so Jesus is going to come, and then he's going to come again, and then he's going to come a third time. That's fantastic, man. That's fantastic. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, he's a 14-year-old kid from, you know, Provo, Utah. A 14-year-old kid. He, well, I don't know, I guess. The last time somebody came to my house and said that they were Elder Johnny, or whatever his name was, I said, you're not, you're not my elder, kid. And I'm not calling you elder. Hey, these people are insane. So if Jesus comes, and then he comes a second time after he came the first time, where did he go? And then he comes a third time. Where did he go after he came the second time? Where did he go? And then he comes a third time? I'm mean, this stuff. I, I don't know what's wrong with people. I, I know what's wrong with people. They think that they just go along with whatever they say in Utah. People are going to think they're a good person. They're going to carry the appearance of being a good person. And that's what Mormon and Mormonism is. It's about being a good person. And they do good things no question about it but inside they're evil all right so when here I got this already open here when or no I don't when Jesus comes back well let me go over here no all right, let's go down here Revelation 1 Behold it, he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him. Matthew 20 Oh Oh Not sure what's going on there. There's not 126 chapters of Matthew? Okay. So when Jesus is talking about the end of the world Notice here in Matthew 24, he says, All the tribes of the earth mourn. So when Jesus comes, there's going to be absolutely no doubt about it. All kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. When he comes in the clouds of heaven, there is going to be absolutely no no mistake about it. It's not like the movie Left Behind at all. People aren't going to be sitting around, looking around, scratching their rear ends, wondering what happened to George and Joanne. They're going to know. Everybody's going to know. There's going to be absolutely no doubting about it. In so much that people will be having heart attacks because they know with absolute certainty that it is the end of the world. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. It is judgment day. It is the great and terrible day of the Lord. Those of us that are saved will be instantly trans 
transformed into our glorified bodies and lifted up into the air to meet the Lord and all of our enemy will be gathered at our feet and they will be destroyed forever the second death and everybody knows it's gonna happen no everybody knows it's coming instinctively we all know it the unsaved reject it they deny it they try to hide from it but there's coming a moment in time when they will no longer be able to deny it they will no longer be able to resist it and that is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and when he comes it's it there is no more opportunity for the unsaved to be saved the only opportunity unsaved people have is right now because when Jesus comes that's it it's over all things will become new when the Lord Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven this stuff here this is science fiction stuff man ridiculous and if you believe it if you believe this stuff then you you uh you really you deserve to believe a lie because you want to believe a lie and you don't want to believe the truth and that is the truth of our lord jesus christ jesus is god almighty all right he's not the brother of satan all right. If you believe that, you believe you uh, deserve to believe a lie. You really do. This stuff is just absolute nonsense. It's unbelievable how popular it is. And think about this: these guys are teaching a thousand-year reign of Christ. All right, they're teaching a thousand-year reign of Christ. I think. I thought. And. Now he said it earlier. I don't. I don't need to replay it. But the point. The the point that I'm making is that if the Mormons are teaching this, and you're not a Mormon, you might want to consider what it is that you believe, right? Because they're believing in something. Uh, you might want to take a step back and re-examine why is it that you believe there's going to be a thousand year reign of Christ? Why is it? Well, if you, everything in your brain was on a blackboard, well, wipe the blackboard clean. Just clear everything off of it and go back to Revelation 20 and read it with a fresh mind. Verse 1, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. This is another vision that an angel is showing John and he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years alright so if he's bound for if he's comes down and he bounds Satan for a thousand years then he was not bound before and then of course if we understand the Old Testament how there was one nation of God one kingdom of God within that nation outside of that nation were the nations deceived by the devil now here comes Jesus and he makes the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him right it's not really it's really not hard to understand therefore I say unto you the kingdom of God should be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof all right you get it so the devil was not bound and why why is he bound so that he should deceive the nations no more it's a huge part of this deal that he should deceive the nations no more so he can no longer have total control over nations like he did in the Old Testament in the Old Testament there was one nation one kingdom of God outside of that nation 
were the nations deceived by the devil. Now here comes Jesus and he makes the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him. Now the devil can no longer deceive the nations like he did before. Right? All right, and cast them in the bottom of the pit and shut them up and set a seal upon them. They should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So the, when the thousand years are fulfilled, it's the end of the world. Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them. That's us. That is those of us that are born of God. And has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. We are kings of God. We are a royal priesthood right now. Those of us that are saved. Those of us that are his elect. We are kings. We are kings. And has made us kings. Not earthly kings, but heavenly kings. We are kings of God right now. We have heavenly thrones, not earthly thrones, but heavenly thrones. And they that sat upon them, that's those of us that are born of the Spirit of God. And judgment has already been given to us. Right? There's the, we are sealed unto the day of redemption. Nothing can ever take that away. Right? In John chapter 11, Jesus says, Whoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The judgment has already been given to us. Nothing can change that. Right? <clears throat> and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Notice here, there's no mention of Jesus reigning a thousand years, and there's no mention of a thousand year kingdom. In fact, the implication is that people will be being beheaded during this time, and there will be people worshiping the beast, and there will be people not worshiping the beast during this thousand years. Now, I won't show you the other modern perversions that twist the Word of God. They do imply that of this idea that there will be a thousand years of zombieism, I guess, where people are walking around without a head. I want you to just erase that from the back, from the blackboard, right? Erase that from the memory. Just look at this fresh. Look at this clean with a fresh mind. You'll notice that there is no mention of Jesus reigning a thousand years, and you'll notice that there is no mention of a thousand year kingdom. Alright, and if you read Luke 1, you go to verse 33, and it says, talking about Jesus, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. So, if Jesus reigned a thousand years, this would be a contradiction. And you would be saying, well, Jesus doesn't reign right now. He's going to reign in the future, and it's only going to be for a short time. Because in the context of everlasting life, a thousand years is a very short time. All right, verse 5. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection all right so it's important to understand that it is appointed unto man once to die and then after this the judgment okay so you can't have a doctrine that contradicts this otherwise one or the other is lying right and what's the bible say study 
to show thyself approved. A workman needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Right? You can just be smart about this. Really, above all, just be honest. Just be honest. All right? The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. So, in Daniel chapter 12, we read about this. What happens at the end of the world. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, and some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. See, it's the end of the world. The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. That's a clue right there. You ought to be able to see it. It's crystal clear. This is the end of the world. At the end of the thousand years, it's the end of the world. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first in resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. Well, what's the first resurrection? Well, there's something wrong with your heart if you're going to say Jesus is not the first resurrection. He clearly is the first resurrection. Right? 1 Corinthians 15, Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. Jesus is the first resurrection. Go back to John 11. What's Jesus say in verse 25? He tells us plainly. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And you're still going to say, oh, Jesus ain't the first resurrection. No, are you the first resurrection? Yeah, good luck, buddy. Notice here, blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. We that are born of God are partakers of his resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. Right? Though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The second death has no power over us. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Why is it a thousand years? Well, this is a unique time period. Because Jesus has been born, he has laid down his life, he has brought it back up and ascended to heaven. This is a very unique time period from that time to the end of the world. It's a very unique time period. First Peter chapter 2. Let's see if I'm close on this here. Yeah, right there. First Peter chapter 2. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Right there. We are priests of God and of Christ. Right there it is. Revelation 1. He has made us kings and priests unto God. See, we are priests of God right now. Go back to Exodus 19. And the Lord says, Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a an holy nation. We are priests of God and of Christ right now. The second death has no power over us right now. Jesus is the first resurrection and we are partakers of his resurrection. And when he returns, we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And this mortal will put on immortality. Okay. And when the thousand years are expired, this is the end of the world. We are lifted up in the air, and Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Why is he loosed? Because all the saved people are taken out of this world, and all you have on the left 
that is on the earth are unsaved people. So now, just like in the Old Testament, when Satan deceived the nations outside of the nation of Israel, so also is Satan once again allowed to deceive the nations like he'd done before. The only difference is now we are up in the air. It's consistent with the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Think about Genesis 3 verse 15. When the Lord said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. See, we're up in the air with the Lord, and he stumps his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying all evil forever. Right? So when a thousand years are expired, it's the end of the world. Satan is loosed out of his prison and he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. So what's Satan do? He gathers the unsaved people. And it's a lot of them. Now, real quickly, think about this. The liars and deceivers that say the thousand years happens after Jesus comes they got a serious problem because of this verse right here and the question you ought to be asking them is Satan gathering saved people because that's all that you have after Jesus comes after Jesus comes when Jesus comes judgment day all the unsaved people are going to be done away with so if you're going to go a thousand years after Jesus comes the only people that are remaining are saved people so who is Satan gathering so what they're teaching is Satan is going to gather saved people and God's going to destroy them. this is as wicked as it gets all right. The reality is that this here is at the end of the world when we are gathered, when the angels of God gather us and we are lifted up in the air, and then Satan gathers the unsaved and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. Right When Jesus comes in the clouds, it's the end of the world. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Right, Psalm 110. Um, Psalm 110 says, And the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at thy right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Right, it's, that's at the end of the world. Revelation 3 verse 9 right behold I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee so we're up in the air our enemy is at our feet all right so there should be no mistake no doubt about it that when the enemy is destroyed we are up in the air with the Lord this is consistent all throughout the Bible. This goes from Genesis to Revelation. Right? Genesis 3 verse 15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And fire comes down. This is Jesus stomping his foot on the head of the serpent and destroying all evil forever and ever that's what we're putting our hope into right and the devil that deceived him was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are we just read in Revelation 19 how the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire and this is just echoing what we already read it's paralleling what we read in Revelation 19 and the vision of Revelation 19 is parallel with the vision 
that we're reading in Revelation 20, this is not a thousand years after the beast and false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. It, they're all thrown into the lake of fire at the same time. It's at the end of the world, a judgment day. All right, don't let anybody deceive you. All right. Be, once again, I, I'll go back to verse 8. The, the liars and the deceiver, the ignorant, that say that, well, a thousand years after Jesus returns, Satan gathers together a whole bunch of people. Well, the only people remaining are saved people. And so you, <laughs> be honest, man. You have to make the argument that God is going to destroy all the saved people. That's the only way for your doctrine to fit. All right, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. This is Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. It's the same thing that we re read in Matthew 24, uh, verse, verses 29 through 31. And so also in Revelation 1, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. All right, it's the same, same thing. All right. And this is all happening on the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's great for us that are saved and terrible for them that are not saved. All right. In Matthew 20 or in Matthew 13, the parable of the wheat and the tares, the tares are are thrown in bundles and burned, but the wheat are gathered into his barn, into the Lord's barn, and they're saved, preserved. Right? And so also with the separating of the sheep and the goat. Right? The sheep are saved and the goat are not saved. Right? And this is on Judgment Day, the great day of the Lord. This is so simple, so easy. And that's why I say it's very, very important to understand what Jesus says in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And he says the same thing, and nobody explains the end of the world better than our Lord Jesus Christ. And the end of the world is when he comes in the clouds of heaven, and the angels of God gather us together, gather us, and lift us up in the air. All right, once you understand that, and then now apply that to everything that you're reading in the book of Revelation. Then the book of Revelation should open up for you. Because it does not teach anything at all contrary to what Jesus teaches us in Matthew 24. Nothing at all. All you have to do is connect the dots. Once you see the parallels, then you can start to understand how simple this stuff is, how amazing this stuff is. It's incredible. It's not confusing at all. The dead which were in them, the judgment that we're reading here, this happens at the end of the world. Think about this. What do you think it is? What, what, what do you think is happening when Jesus sends his angels to gather together the elect? That's the judgment of God. Now, we've already been determined. We are the elect already. So we're being taken out of this wicked world. What do you think's happening? This is the judgment of God. And all the evil is going to be destroyed. That's the judgment of God. That's the great day of the Lord. And what do you think it was, man? It can't be anything else. It's not at half time. It's not the end of the third quarter. It's the end of the world. You should have you should have saw it, man. You should have saw it. It's gonna play out like that. And this is consistent all throughout the Bible. And I could go on and on and on about this. But I've already gone on too long. This stuff is its nonsense. It's nonsense. It's unbelievable how much deception there is in the world. And it's right to call them out on it. And I'm going to encourage you again. And I'll encourage you tomorrow. God willing. To believe 
the Bible that you hold in your hands. Believe it is from God because it is. It's directly from God. And that's the key. The f key to faith. The key to understanding. The, I'm sorry. The key to understanding is faith. It's always been about faith. All right. I'm going to close on this. Hebrews 11. This incredible, amazing chapter. I want you to check this out. Look at this. Faith. Mentioned 27 times. These yellow marks are every time the word faith is mentioned. All right. Notice here. Abel, from all the way from Cain and Abel. Enoch to Noah, Abraham, and so on and so forth. It's always been about faith, man. Believe. Without faith, you don't have anything. You have no hope. So, it's always been about faith, man. Believe the Bible that you hold in your hands. Don't forget, forget the Hebrew and the Greek. Those are dead languages. They don't matter. Just believe the Bible that you hold in your hands. Believe it is from God because it is. All right, now that's it. You guys have a great day. Leave a comment. Challenge me. Even if you don't believe the question you're asking, challenge me or encourage me. Whatever you like, anything. I, I appreciate the comments very much and enjoy this day. Remember that. Enjoy this day. Man, you could go out. You, you're worrying about this and you're worrying about that. And, and then you can go out side your door and walk out to the sidewalk and a bus run you over. And think about that. I mean, it could happen. So what is all this worrying going to do for you? I mean, that moment when that bus is about to hit you, that moment you're going to realize, man, I did all this worrying for nothing. I'm worrying about tomorrow. I'm worrying about next week. I'm worrying about a month from now. And then you go outside and you get run over. All that worry is for nothing. All right, so stop worrying. And just enjoy this day. Enjoy this moment. Appreciate what you have right now. And know, you know, that there's a better world that awaits for us. We have to endure the hardships of this world. Think about what our Lord Jesus had to endure. All right. Think about what he had to suffer. So think about our suffering. We suffer just like he suffered. But it's okay. Everything's going to be alright. Because we have a world, a much greater world that waits for us. And that world could come at any moment. So if Jesus comes today and you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs, worried to death, worrying yourself sick, and then here comes Jesus, then you're going to realize what a fool you are doing all this warning. He's going to come soon enough, man. In terms of everlasting life compared to this short time that we're living here in this world, it's nothing. You'll soon forget about all this stuff that you constantly worry about. And I get it now. I understand. Some people, they just love to worry. Just love it. Just, it's so much fun to worry about this and that. But I'm telling you, stop worrying. All that worrying that you're doing has got me worried. Well, okay. All right, enough of that. Enjoy the day.